dietary habits are crucial factors in determining not only the health of people, but also of the ecosystem. Climate change is a key challenge humanity is facing. Technological innovation to address environmental and health challenges is crucial, but is at risk of failure if not properly communicated to citizens, policymakers and stakeholders overall. We believe citizens and consumers must be engaged in any innovation process from the very beginning. Psychology and social sciences offer strategies and tools to promote behavioral change and acceptance of innovation in food and healthcare systems. We wanted to train a new generation of psychologists able to bridge the gap between hard sciences and society. The masters offer an advanced training in various psychological disciplines that lead to behavioral change in sustainable consumption, healthy eating, and well-being but it also provides an advanced research methods training and it provides courses about fundamentals of agri-food systems and nutrition as well. Hands on experience will be key for our students. We will offer lab activities over the course program and also for the thesis program. Also, we will have the occasion to have a professional internship in industries and their care organization during the second year of university degree. The Master in Consumer Behavior adopts an experiential learning approach. This is based on in-class activities on case studies and an internship in a company at the local, national or international level. Students will live a truly local experience. Classes take place in Cremona, at the heart of the Italian food valley. In this course, we bring together the global world with our local community, our value and our culture. Università Cattolica has recently moved here in Cremona in the new campus, which used to be a monastery, the former monastery of Santa Monica. The new campus is set to design the future for the younger generations, highlighting the importance of learning and making most of the territorial resources. You will be given the opportunity to get a double degree with European partner universities. Double degree programs offer students the possibility to obtain a double qualification by the end of their studies and the chance to study part of their degree program at one of the partner universities. We will offer many post-degree job opportunities, starting from consumer research specialist, consumer engagement specialist, uh, patient advocacy manager, expert in communication for non-profit organization, food psychologist, well-being psychologist, and consultant for healthcare organization. Do you want to be part of this next generation of psychologists? Great, welcome everybody to this webinar that we are now joining to hear more about this program about the psychology in the future to bridge the gap between food, health and environments. As you just saw in the brief introduction video, uh, we will explain what that means and uh, yeah, all the details in this uh, upcoming, well, 45 minutes or so. And as you already briefly saw, we have various presenters lined up um, before we go over to them, I will briefly explain to you some of the interactive options. Uh, first of all, of course, you can say where you're logging in from, as I see already many people are doing. So great to see already a lot of different countries joining in. Welcome, everyone. And if you have any questions by any, at any time, you can uh, submit these questions through the panel called questions at the right bottom. Please do that there, because then we make sure not to miss them. If you're watching the recording, you can also, by the way, uh, write your questions. So you can still do that. Of course, we cannot answer them live, but uh, we can come back to you later. Also, I opened up a brief poll. Um, so that is just to see a bit more about you, to learn about your background. And um, yeah, we'll open up a couple of polling questions throughout the session. And last but not least, we have a little fun button as well, just to make it even more interactive. At the bottom of the screen, you see a button called React. If you click on that, you can give your reaction at any time uh, through the presentation. Maybe you uh, like something, exactly. You can click on any of those icons uh, that's just to interact and make it more fun for the presenters as well. Well, talking about presenters, let's go over to them as we have 
uh, today four presenters lined up for you. We will start with the moderator from Catolica, from I should say Universita Catolica de Sacro Cuore, and um, Federica. You can pronounce that better than me, but let's go ahead and introduce yourself and the others. Thank you, Luke. Thank you very much for your introduction. Uh, my name is Federica and I work at the International Marketing and Recruitment Team at Università Cattolica del Sacro Cuore di Milano. Uh, I would like to thank you for joining this masterclass about our new uh, two-year master degree uh, in consumer behavior, psychology applied to food, health and environment. Um, this psychology program is completely taught in English at our beautiful campus in Cremona and the programs belongs to the faculties of psychology and agricultural food and environmental sciences, which are two leading faculties in our university, which have been ranked as top 150 globally, which is an amazing achievement. Uh, but before deep diving into the core of the, the program and of the masterclass, um, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Um, we have Professor Gwendolina Graffigno. Hi. Thank you. Then we have Professor Maria Rosaya Savarese. Hello. Hello. Hello to everyone. Thank you for joining. I'm Maria Rosaria. I'm an assistant professor at the Faculty of Psychology and an researcher in Engage Mounds Hub Research Center. Thank you. And then we have Professor Giovanni Umberto Resi. Well, thank you very much. Uh, good, um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, well, my name is Giovanni, and uh, I'm Professor of uh, Social and Community Health Psychology at Oregon University. And I also uh, collaborate with the Cherise Vico Research Institute in Community Development. Thank you. Um, so, uh, as I was saying, uh, the, the program itself is taught uh, completely in English in our beautiful campus um, in Cremona. And I would like to give you a little bit of information about our university and our campuses. In fact, um, Università Cattolica has five different campuses and it's the largest private university in Europe with more than uh, 30,000 students, 10% of which are international. Um, the oldest and biggest campus is located in Milan, where we have the majority of our programs and faculties and where the um, international office is located. Then we have um, another campus in Rome where we have our medicine related programs. Uh, we have another campus in Brescia and other two campuses in Piacenza and Cremona. And in fact, the program of consumer behavior is taught in the beautiful campus of Cremona, um, where the, the global world and the local community mixed and combines together. In fact, this, um, this campus, which is the campus of Santa Monica, uh, used to be an old monastery from the 16th century, which has been, uh, which has been recently renovated. Um, and so now I will um, let our speaker uh, talk more about the program and discover together why consumer behavior, well-being and health are so important in uh, today's societies. I think we're facing a little issue with the sound, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, it is breaking up at my end here. If that's the same for you, the professors, maybe you um, can continue. Um, yeah. I think that Luke is suggesting that me or Maria Rosaria step in, but perhaps yeah, uh, Professor Grafinha may take out her camera and give it a, yeah. a, a last try before we, we step in. Yes, please. Can you hear me I believe it's still no, not up, I... all. Please go ahead, yeah. um, Maria Rosaria or Giovanni. Sorry about okay. that. Okay. 
Maria Rosa, uh, you want me to? Yep. Yeah, yes, please. We can. Yeah. Just okay, I'll, just... I'll, I'll I'll step in. Uh, I'll I'll do my best <laughs> to to play the the program coordinator role, uh, not the program coordinator. So um, I'll I'll do my best in this in this new role that I'm just stepping in. So uh, Professor Rafinha was trying to tell us uh, about the situation of uh, health. In, uh, in Western societies today. So uh, when she says that uh, we are victim of a storm, uh, it's, a, a, it's a big storm. It's a big storm because uh, the Western world has been transitioning over the past, let's say, uh, 50 years or so uh, from a, uh, what we can understand as a kind of, kind of a traditional health situation in which uh, the majority of the causes of disease and death were related to uh, infectious diseases. Uh, well, a part of the COVID, uh, there was kind of a parenthesis into our world, a very sad parenthesis, I would add. Uh, I mean, the modern healthcare, healthcare sector has to face uh, a kind of a very different situation in which chronic diseases are the most important causes of uh, uh, disease, disability, and death. Uh, and that uh, puts uh, um, a, a great burden on the healthcare sector because you can imagine that the amount of spending, the amount of money, the amount of funding that the healthcare sector has to put in diseases like, for example, diabetes, cancer, uh, and so on. Uh, and importantly uh, for our program, there is a, let's say, um, I mean, the health situation, uh, if you take it and look at it from a one, uh, one health perspective, is very much related to the health of our planet. So many of the things that cause uh, diseases, that cause uh, poor health, in people are very much related to uh, the respect of the environment. Just to mention one of the most important that, that we think is one of the most important factor is our diet. What we eat not only uh, affects our health, we, we know that you know, our diet in terms of uh, you know, uh, dietary habits and lifestyles clearly have an impact on, on our health outcomes, on the short term and long term, like you know the, the usual things, eating not too much uh, sugar, not too much salty, and things like that. But at the same time, um, a, a healthier diet is also a more sustainable diet. And I'm just making one very simple example, which is somehow related to the presentation that I was going to give uh, in a few minutes. So uh, Italy and other countries. In, uh, in, uh, in Southern Europe are associated with, with the uh, Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet is uh, uh, basically a diet that is uh, um, uh, characterized by a high intake of vegetables and low intake of uh, uh, red meat and things like that. Now, interestingly enough, the Mediterranean diet has been recognized as both healthy and sustainable, among the healthiest and the most sustainable, um, sustainable dietary uh, lifestyles that you can, you can take. So the two things, and this is an example of how health and sustainability are very much related in a, in a one health perspective. But I, I won't go in um, too much in, uh, in length to talk about that. And I will try to, uh, well, this is basically what I've been talking about so far. So we'll skip to that. Um, now, the, the third pillars of our program, it is that we think that uh, technological innovation, so in food sciences, which we partner with in, uh, in this program, uh, technological innovation is important to both meet health and uh, sustainable uh, development challenges. However, um, we have kind of seen that with uh, COVID and development of vaccines. I mean, the medical sector and the industries and other uh, research center can produce like beautifully mastered, in that case was vaccine, but beautifully mastered uh, and engineered new products. 
But if we are not able to engage people, engage the population, involve them throughout all the phases of the research development and communicate research funding, uh, uh, you know, at, at the end, uh, uh, sometimes this, you know, huge innovation can just, uh, you know, be left apart and not, not being fully used. So that's why in this program we put together psychologists as behavioral experts and scientists and technical experts, in particular, uh, partnering with the uh, Faculty of Agricultural and uh, Food Sciences that was mentioned before. So this is really, uh, we think, the most innovative aspects of, uh, of this program. Um, so yeah, so uh, it's a challenge. It's a big challenge for us because it's a, it's very, it's a very innovative program that looks at the future. But what we really want to do is to train this new generation of psychologists that are both knowledgeable of behavior change techniques, communication, uh, um, community and people's engagement, all things that are very important to, uh, you know, understanding people's behavior uh, and how to change it. But also the uh, psychologists that have some at least basic uh, uh, training in uh, uh, technical sciences, because they also have to be knowledgeable of things like if you work in a food industry or you work toward uh, improving the uh, dietary habits in people, you need to have at least some basic ideas of what nutrition is, of what a good diet and a healthy diet is. So, um, so the, the program uh, tackles this challenge by providing uh, uh, training in three key pillars, let's say, uh, in, in the program. As I mentioned, disciplines of psychologists that are key to behavior change. And I just mentioned a few of them, uh, not the most important perhaps, but some of the most important. So consumer psychology. Clinical health, health psychology is related to, um, for example, uh, this is related to food consumption. Uh, decision making, how people take decision and nudge theory. And my own course, which is community and social psychology, which is about understanding community and social determinants of health behaviors and how to address them. Then we provide training on advanced research methods. And this is important. I was going to mention in my presentation, but I will kind of anticipate it in here. Uh, we think that uh, psychologists of the future will need to have uh, strong training, a strong capacity to conduct uh, multi-method research, both qualitative, that means interviews, focus groups, and quantitative uh, research, including like surveys and experimental research, including big data. And we offer that. That is important because uh, to change behavior, others' behavior, we need to understand what are the drivers of others' behavior or people's behavior. And then, as I mentioned before, we provide some fundamentals of uh, uh, nutrition and how the agri-food system works. It's basically the process that brings food from the farm where it's produced to the fork where it's consumed. Uh, and things related to, to that very, very complex, but uh, fascinating uh, uh, process. Um, yes, so uh, I won't go into further detail uh, in regard to that. Uh, I would just briefly mention some of the uh, job opportunities uh, that we think uh, and we believe and we have tested with uh, our local and national international companies some of the profiles that of, uh, of students that will come out from our program. And so it was mentioned in the video, if you have uh, watched it at the beginning of this presentation, but we, uh, you will be able to work as a health psychology, as a behavior change specialist, uh, both in uh, uh, public institution and uh, private organizations like company. Uh, you may be working uh, as a psychology expert in food related 
diseases, as I said, a well-being psycho psychologist. If you work, would like to work in the healthcare sector, you might be interested in working as a patient advocacy manager, uh, or if you are more interested in a consumer-oriented, uh, let's say, kind of approach, uh, there, will, there will be opportunity as, as a consumer and marketing researcher, as a communication specialist for different kind of uh, um, companies, or as the consumer's uh, inside manager or marketing intelligence. And I hope I might strong be at least the most important, but I'm sure there are uh, many others. Um, if my colleague Maria Rosa uh, wants to add anything, or we can perhaps continue. Um, I think we can continue. I can add something while I'm speaking uh, on my presentation, maybe. Uh, if there are any questions, please, we are here to answer to you, so you can also interrupt us. So uh, by now, thank you uh, to Giovanni. Uh, we have understood a little bit of the organization of our master's degree and a little bit which are the outcomes and the possibility for you uh, to work. Now, me and Giovanni will give you uh, a little touch about uh, how it's possible to use the One Health approach, One Health perspective in order to understand, to comprehend people's behavior and in order to orient them, to change them towards uh, uh, different uh, uh, and better, more sustainable, healthier uh, behavior. Uh, we will talk about uh, two research cases that I hope are of interest uh, of you. Um, I will talk uh, about uh, a project that is inserted in the idea. Uh, so basically we have said that one health approach uh, calls all of us, in particular the psychologists who are able to understand people's behavior and to change it, to uh, inquire which are the most, uh, the best and most effective ways of engage on supporting people to change their behavior. And uh, in particular, this happened for, for some frail, uh, target of the population, uh, such as uh, the elderly people, yeah, the the aging the aging part of the population. Uh, in particular, during the last years, we have seen a, a change uh, of uh, scenario, and we pass from the concept of how to live healthy, how to age healthy and actively. Uh, to the concept of uh, longevity. What does it change? It changes the idea that uh, aging and the aged uh, part of our life just begin at the end, okay, of our process of living. Um, but changing the perspective uh, pushes us to understand that uh, uh, we don't have to, we don't have to consider just elderly age as the last part of our life, but to do something for the prevention of some of the challenges that we have seen in the introduction. We have to consider not only the aging, but the longevity, a process that begins really, really in advance in childhood or adulthood, and that help um, support all the citizens to live better and well during all these phases to arrive prepared and in, uh, in a good health, in a good shape at the end of their life. So passing from aging to longevity is a crucial key in order to face challenges that we are seeing. And the One Health approach can also help us in order to understand which are the levers to support this change of mentality. In particular, in this big concept of longevity, uh, and as psychologists, you have seen in the program that we have a lot of attention on the methodological part of our courses. So we really care about methodological preparation of our students. Why? Because we think that the methodological assets in particular, all the tools that allows uh, uh, psychologists and specialists to understand, to comprehend, and to engage people in changing their behavior are necessary in order to activate this new scenario and this new mentality. How to engage people? There, I think starting from the bottom. So just using uh, the places, uh, in particular the city, as a place where people live and a place that is a partner for the change, not only a place where people live and just in a uh, just in a perspective that you use the city and then you rip it away and uh, 
you know, just a, on our convenience. But the city can become a real ally to uh, the change and really be considered as a partner of the change itself. That means uh, this concept of city of longevity has been introduced by the Newcastle Center of Innovation in Aging that you can find on the internet. It is a really um, a big center and important center in the concept of longevity and the approach to one health to people's aging. Uh, in particular, as I told you, the city is a real partner, a true actor of change. What does it mean? It means that at the beginning, you can understand people's behavior, asking them in a systematic way. So use the knowledge that people every day produce naturally, spontaneously in their context, systematize it and use it as knowledge that you can, again, use for the change. So in order to enhance better changes and more sustainable changes. Uh, sustainable in terms of uh, um, health environment, but also in terms of resources, because we have seen that we are in a storm. So of course, we have some issues about the resources we have. But catching the opportunities from the storms, it means that we can um, use the resources and use the city and the people who live in the city as a resource in order to understand and change behaviors. Uh, the city is also a measurable concept. So again, people who live there can have some behaviors, you can understand them, you can measure them. So using sophisticated analysis can help to support behavioral change using the city as a container, as a, um, a place where things happen and we can understand why and we can support people to uh, live better. I will say two examples uh, of projects that we are uh, doing uh, in our context in Italy now, in particular uh, are located uh, in Cremona, but with a broader view on uh, all uh, uh, the cities that we have in Italy. As you have seen, Cremona is a strategical uh, place in Italy where to study uh, behavioral conducts related to food and health and sustainability, of course, because it's strictly related to food and health. And so uh, I will uh, describe you briefly these two projects. Uh, social care, in particular, is a. Um, these are ongoing projects. So, if you are interested, we have uh, the results of the first phases that we can show uh, and we can share with you. Uh, so, our ongoing project uh, focuses on the role of the city and the citizen in uh, as a player for the change. In particular, we involved in social care institution third sector associations and uh, volunteers in the creation of an ecosystem of uh, uh, longevity, an ecosystem of services dedicated to the third age and uh, the people who take care of the elderly, such as the caregivers, for example. Um, social care, what is it? It's an online platform where we have mapped and insert all the services uh, related to the elderly and their caregiver in the territory. We have mapped and categorized all these services and uh, uh, the citizen can go to the offices and to the entities that offer social care that are embraced this platform as a tool to involve the citizen and to orient the citizen. They can go there, they can ask for need I need a transportation for my loved one. I need help in supporting. I need psychological support because I'm living in a stressful uh, period of, of my life because I have to take care of, of my loved one. So I, I really need a help. Okay, we can help you and we can find with few keywords all the services in the territory that can offer you uh, an answer to your question to, to, to address your need. Uh, this is social care, it's still ongoing and again we are broadening our services, we are broadening the map uh, phase and we are uh, also um, inserting uh, new entities and new volunteers associations to this project in order to make it bigger and more um, uh, efficient <laughs> to all our instead, It's our first uh, uh, tentative that we have put in place in order to organize uh, a, a periodic table of needs that we show you here as an example. 
um, periodic uh, table of needs, that is the masterpiece, the, the, the biggest concept around the, the behind the city of longevity. Uh, what have we done? We have uh, analyzed, we have interviewed uh, in person, people from the context uh, with different uh, uh, perspectives, stakeholders, citizens, uh, caregivers, formal and informal, in order to catch, to understand it, to map which are these needs. So the, the understanding of the needs is at the base of, also of social care. So understanding these needs and prioritizing these needs allowed us uh, to create this periodic table. Uh, how, how to use the periodic table. The table is a tool that allows the researchers and whoever is interested in organize intervention, uh, educational programs and everything that we need in the context to see which are the specific needs of people related to different areas in order to be really effective and really touch the crucial point of the city. Now we are still working on this project. We are prioritizing these needs in order to understand which are the priorities for the context from the context itself. So the, the outcome is also the process that we are using in order to arrive to the outcome itself. So I had just one final chart to um, give you the idea of uh, how much work can be done uh, in the One Health perspective applied to longevity concept. Only in the last year, we have uh, involved more than 50 participants in the co-creation process, both in social care and uh, in uh, bee care. We have more than 80 professional in general, but also individuals, caregiver, uh, so all the targets involved in this concept involved in our, um, in our project. Uh, we have trained more than 40 operators, social and health operators and volunteers to use social care and to help out with the, the uh, periodic table of needs. So numbers that uh, can be seen as uh, a little achievement, Yes, because we are still at the beginning. This concept is really new, as my colleague uh, told you before. We are, we can see the possibilities and the, also the challenges that we have, but we are really sure that this is the key uh, for psychologists, uh, in particular, to have a role in the challenges of tomorrow. So we really believe that for psychologists, this is really important, and this is a, a place where they can experiment. Uh, uh, with the training, uh, all these new theories and approaches. So thank you for the attention. Right, I guess it's my turn. Uh, so uh, my, my colleague talked about the elderly and I will be talking about the adolescents, the youth in particular. Uh, can, yes, thank you very much. I was asking about to, to get the presentation back. So uh, you know me already. Um, today um, I will talk you uh, to, to tell you about uh, Food Game, which is uh, a health promotion intervention that we've been working with uh, over the last couple of years. And uh, this in, this intervention is a school-based intervention. I will tell you more about that. But uh, I, I will talk about it because it offers an example of how psychologists can be involved uh, in uh, behavior change and in health promotion efforts, in this case, in the, uh, in the school environment, in school settings. So uh, in addition to, um, to teaching, uh, a big chunk of my, of my work uh, is uh, doing evaluation and consultancies to uh, public institutions, health agencies, and the non-profit organizations around health promotion intervention. Uh, psychologists really have, are are from our perspective key professionals in these uh, in these kind of efforts. So, but um, I already kind of uh, uh, talked about the Mediterranean diet before and how it uh, somehow relates to the content of this of this program and how uh, adopting and use uh, and, and adherence to the Mediterranean diet is both uh, beneficial to people's health and the environment. Um, the problem is, the challenge is, uh, 
uh, Italy is ever dollars. Abandoning. Uh, uh, proportion of uh, uh, ultra processed food. Uh, so, this kind of intervention. Um, that is called the food game, as I said, are intervention that try to tackle these, uh, uh, this kind of issue. So what is food game? A food game uh, is a gamified school-based program. Uh, it is run by the uh, Milan Local Health uh, Agency, and it basically works to uh, promote the adoption of uh, uh, the Mediterranean diet and more sustainable behaviors and in, more, uh, in general and a more active life in general. It is based um, on two key pillars. Uh, the first pillar is peer-led uh, learning, uh, which basically mean and I won't be able to get into detail, but I'm open to question later if you have some. But basically, it's not based on, on an informative approach. It's not about telling adolescents how they should eat, what they should eat, but it's about having them work together in groups, in teams, to kind of do research, understand, and facilitate learning and kind of peer modeling. So learning from others. From other and others, and in particular peers from their from their group, uh, it's kind of an active learning approach more than a passive learning approach, if I may say. Uh, and the second pillar is gamification. Uh, how we work? Gamification is uh, uh, is kind of a buzzword. It's very much used. Uh, most of the apps that you might be using uh, uh, in your mobile phone are actually gamified apps. That means that are, they provide kind of, kind of a gaming context to sustain motivation and engagement with the app. Uh, this uh, food game is one of the few examples in the world in which the gamification process uh, so putting some game elements into non-gaming context is applied into uh, non-digital intervention. And it works in this way. You have students uh, and teams of students that work together towards addressing a number of health challenges, th thematic challenges. Um, for example, organizing a free day at school or uh, trying to change uh, uh, the menu of the cafeteria at school toward a more healthier, uh, toward the provision of healthier option and things like that. So they have to work together and they uh, compete with other teams, uh, that's why it's a game, with other teams from other schools. So basically they as they complete the challenge, they get a number of points uh, and they are rewarded. And then you have a uh, leather boards and at the end of the year, there is a winning team. OK, so it's a kind of a kind of a big game. Um, and other game game elements uh, are, are things like, for example, yeah, getting points, competition and cooperation. But more than talking about the intervention, which hopefully you kind of grasp a kind of an overall idea, I would like to tell you a little bit more about of our approach. So how we work with organizations and institutions to kind of uh, improve intervention and determine effectiveness of intervention. So what is called basically the evaluation of intervention. So our approach uh, is empowerment evaluation. Uh, empowerment evaluation is a kind of a, an approach that was developed by two scholars from the US, uh, which are, uh, are David Fetterman and Abraham Wondersman. And in, in a very, in a nutshell, it is about uh, empowering individuals, organizations, and community to become active partners and active participants in the evaluation process itself. So they are not passive participants of the evaluation process. It's not us, the university, that it goes to organization to evaluate them, but it's really something that we co-design and co-create together. And it's based on five principles uh, that I, I want that I just don't have time to tell you about uh, about them in details, but they all reflect this idea of participatory, 
scientific and cyclical nature of, uh, uh, of the evaluation. So I, I, I told you that we have engaged and we're still working with Food Game in a two years evaluation process. So it takes time. And obviously I don't have time to tell you all the things that we've done in this two year. What I just want to point out are some of the key things and focusing on some aspects of our work uh, that somehow indicate what skills and what capacities psychology students and psychologists of the future in particular need to conduct this kind of work in collaboration with organizations, institutions, and even companies. So the first aspect that I would like to stress is the idea that less and less psychologists are professionals that wait for people behind the counter, behind the desk and work just with other psychologists or with end users. What you get, uh, it's an environment that is a highly interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary environment. So you will need to be able to work with other disciplines uh, and other professional and even lay people like citizens uh, or patients uh, and engage with them truly collaborative participatory approaches and create collaborative relationships with them. In the case of food game, we had to work with uh, healthcare professionals, nutrition experts from the health agency, but also teachers, school administrators, and uh, uh, not the least the students themselves. The second, so interdisciplinarity, first aspect. Second aspect, uh, the use, I mean, obviously, you will be expected to be highly knowledgeable of psychological theories. So uh, what does psychologists bring to the table in this case in interdisciplinary work? They bring theory and scientific method. About theory, in our work, in this work in particular, we brought to the table to people who were not knowledgeable of psychological theories, uh, our knowledge of things like motivational patterns, what motivates people to stay engaged in a program, uh, gamification theory, learning, uh, different learning approaches, like the one that I've mentioned, peer-led uh, approaches. So that technical psychological knowledge is very important to bring to the table. Uh, third pillar, third things that are in, for, from our perspective is important for psychology students of the future is, as I mentioned before, I won't repeat myself, but being able to conduct rigorous multi-method research. In the case of Food Game, we have conducted mixed methods, multi-method research, uh, collecting interview data with uh, uh, teachers and um, um, the program staff, we conducted focus group with the students and we conducted a longitudinal survey with students. Longitudinal survey means uh, that we uh, collected data multiple times throughout the program. So you, you see how you know, qualitative research, quantitative research kind of mix together and um, both are important. Now, the, the diff difficult thing is to put all this data together and you know, give any, any meaning, any sense. And that's the fourth pillar. The fourth pillar is about communicating results, research results to uh, the people we work with, uh, to other professions that perhaps don't have such a uh, technical knowledge as we do have in psychological theories, uh, including lay people. Uh, and this is very important to us. And it's a, it's a big part of, of the program. Last but not least, uh, we do, you remember, I told you, empowerment evaluation uh, is about involving people in evaluation to increase, uh, to improve uh, programs, make them more effective, make them more sustainable. And therefore, uh, the last important ability skill that future psychologists will need to have, it is this capacity to translate what we have learned into capacity building, building, improving programs and innovation. So capacity building through innovation. In the case of food game, what we have brought to the table was innovative uh, techniques, 
that were then implemented and tested in the program to uh, kind of make it better. And uh, to sum up, uh, we think that our program uh, addresses uh, most of these uh, needs that uh, future psychologists will need to have. These that I mentioned are some of the skills that are important to us. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Savarese, mentioned others. And uh, uh, well, we think it's a very innovative program. And, uh, and we're, I think we, we can say we are open for, for questions. We can leave sometimes for questions now. Thank you very much, Professor, and also thank you for stepping in at the beginning of the presentation. Now, um, before going to uh, before starting the Q and A, I would like to give you some information in case you wish to join this beautiful program uh, for a September 2024 intake. Uh, so applications are uh, open if you want to join us. Um, you need to have a bachelor degree related to psychology, um, and you. Um, need to have at least 120 uh, credits in the field of psychology, okay? So this, uh, keep this in mind. Um, and you must obtain your bachelor degree before July 31st, 2024, if you wish to start for the academic year 24-25. Um, since the program, of course, is completely taught in English, you also need to provide us with the proof of your English level, which should be at least um, B2 level. You can also provide us with an official language certificate, such as an IELTS, TOEFL, or Cambridge English, or um, a proof that your bachelor degree studies were fully taught in English. Um, what kind of documents do you need? So you need um, a copy of your passport or ID card. Then we need a copy of your um, high school diploma, um, an official transcript or records uh, of your bachelor degree with the grades and the context the content that you studied, and a copy of your bachelor degree if you already have it. And then an academic reference letter, a motivation letter, and your CV, and of course, the copy of English language proficiency. And um, make sure that, I mean, all these procedures apply to students who have a non-Italian qualification. Okay, so international students with a non-Italian bachelor degree. Um, the next deadline to submit your application is March 26. Uh, 26 um, and then we have another deadline on May 9th, which is the final deadline for non-EU students who must apply for a study visa. And then the final deadline for uh, European students is June 27. Um, in terms of tuition fee, uh, the tuition fee is divided um, according to the fiscal residency. So uh, students that have uh, an, a family income produced in Italy will be uh, paying a, a yearly tuition fee that ranges from 3,800 to 10,400. Um, while students that have uh, a family income generated in a European country will be paying 6,620. Uh, 25 um, um, euros per year. Well, if you have um, a family income produced in a non EU country, the tuition fee will be 9,050 uh, euros per year. However, you can apply for the UCSC International Scholarship, which is um, a discount. Uh, so instead, you will be paying 6,400. Um, we also have um, scholarship options for also Italian and European residents, and you can check all these uh, scholarship options on the EDUCAT website. Uh, last but not least, if you have any questions or doubts about the program, application procedures and timeline, you can check our website and uh, send us an email or uh, call us, and we will be happy to, to help you. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Federica, for you as well, and for anyone else as well, all the presenters. Uh, thank you for your time and your detailed explanations, and uh, especially uh, Giovanni as well for your uh, your masterclass part. So gr great to see. Uh, I think the audience has enjoyed that already. Um, now it's the part that we go over to the questions. So we already received some questions from the live audience, so to say, so I will go through them. Um, now, just to mention for the people that are watching the recording, as I know these days a lot of people do, you can also still write your questions at any time through the panel. 
difficult questions at the bottom. You can also participate in the pollings. Um, so please do as well as we like to hear your feedback, of course, as well. And um, yeah, we can come back to you after the session. Now let's go to the questions. Um, we have a question from Sergey uh, asking, can you please tell me how much are the living costs approximately in Cremona? Who can say something about that? Um, I can say something and mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, yes, Giovanni and Gwendalina can uh, add something if they think. So uh, Cremona is a medium, uh, medium sized city uh, based in the north of Italy. Uh, I'm saying that because it's uh, um, very far, far from the costs that we have in a big city such as Milan or Rome, especially living costs. Mm -hmm. So for living, uh, for the rent uh, of a house or and room. And uh, of course, it's a university city. Uh, so there are a lot of facilities uh, for students in the campus and around the campus uh, because really the city is building a community around the university considering the not the big size of the cities it's uh, it's really feasible to do it so uh, i cannot be exactly precise about the living cost uh, but i can say it's really uh, tailored uh, on the students life as a city uh, more than others, probably in Italy. Uh, so that helps in order to support the costs, I think. I don't know if Giovanni or Federica can say something more. Uh, I may add something very, very quickly. Um, from a student perspective, so Cremona, as uh, uh, my colleague says, is a, it's a medium sized city but it benefits from also being close to large cities like, like Milan and others, not too far. So uh, it gives the opportunity to, so it's about a one hour train from Milan, so not much, easily doable. Um, I would say that uh, that is a good fit for students in the sense that uh, uh, it's not as pricey as uh, big cities like Milan or Rome that you might know better. Uh, but at the same time, you're still able to somehow enjoy uh, some of the benefits of being close to a, to a large and uh, kind of, uh, let's say, uh, international city as Milan. So you kind of can experience both. Perfect. Great. Well, thank you for that addition. And I hope that answered your question, Sergei. Otherwise, let us know. Next question from uh, Anna Marie um, asking which employment you will get at the end of the degree. Uh, so I can say something. Uh, um, Giovanni already explained you some possibility for the employment. Right. In general, we train psychologists able to both health and food psychology. So health area uh, is about uh, health psychology, clinical psychology, community psychology, social psychologists uh, apply to the challenges that we have seen, so food, health and environment. And from a little bit more consumer perspective, people can be uh, implied into uh, market research companies, uh, in food companies in general, uh, that there are plenty of in the area of Cremona because it's called the Food Valley. So, of course, you will find a lot of industries, also international, very big names. Um, communication area and, uh, and more or less these are the two areas. I think you can find more details in the web page of the master course, but, but these are the, the areas, yes. Okay. Thank you. And correct next question for Mary. Um, Mary graduated four years uh, from the nutrition and dietics uh, program. Can she apply for this master program? Just wondering. So um, it's it's possible for us to check the psychological credits uh, that uh, someone has. Uh, so we need to verify each case uh, as, as it is. 
So the, the standard, uh, uh, it's, uh, um, really, it's for psychology, so bachelor in psychology uh, or something similar. Uh, but we can uh, understand uh, the profile of the individual uh, applicant in order to understand if they have uh, enough psychological social uh, sciences credit uh, to, to apply. So I think we can manage case by case, uh, but for sure there is a big part of social, human and psychological credit to have in your background. So easily each of the students can set up a little bit of evalu self-evaluation about it. And then, of course, if you have doubts, we can work on it together. OK, great. Thank you for that, those details. And I hope that answered the question is for Mary as well. Um, Sergey was wondering if there's a special program for refugees, I guess, maybe leaning in towards scholarships, uh, maybe in that sense. Um, yeah, you was mentioned something about this, but maybe Federica, I think you mentioned. Yes, this. I can answer to this question. So, um, no, actually, we don't have, we do not have scholarships. They are fully funded. So, um, if you are um, a non-EU resident, you can apply for the UCSC International Scholarship, which guarantee, I mean, which guarantees you in case you get the scholarship, um, a thirty-seven percent discount, both for the first year and second year, in case you get a scholarship um you can also i mean you can also um apply for the educat scholarship but just be aware that you can uh receive one of the two uh so not both of them and the educat scholarship um it's a regional uh financial aid so it's both merit-based and based on on the financial background of the family so uh also in this case is not um a full coverage um of the tuition fee it's a financial aid and um and so yes, uh, it doesn't cover the the cost of accommodation or uh, the living cost. It's a it's a partial fee reduction. Okay, thank you, Federica. That is good to know. Um, question. Let's see, coming in from Nadin. Is it possible to study a part online? No, actually, the program um, is completely taught at the campus, so it's not an online program. Yeah, okay, thank you. That clarifies that. Um, question from Aibata, if I say that right. Uh, do you only have to have a bachelor in psychology? I think the same as we said before. Yeah. So yes basically yes but it can be evaluated at profile in other disciplines where you know that you already have uh credits in psychological sciences so if you already have some of these we can evaluate the profile and we can see if you arrive to the total amount that we need uh, if you have a bachelor degree in psychology you are sure you can be enrolled Yes, yeah, so, so just keep in mind that this is uh, a master degree basically in psychology. So, I mean, also to other um, master degrees offers at our university, we usually require students to have a similar academic background. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I see there was a follow up question from Sergio about the living cost um, compared to Milan, but I think if I understand that was answered um yes more or less i yeah. i read the question but i i looked on google but i can't find anything really mm -hmm. so i i have no idea i don't know my colleague but uh i i i don't know where the ten thousand euros what does it mean if it's i don't think it's per month because yeah. no, <laughs> per I, year yes, or, I would or say what yes, yes. <laughs> no, um, much cheap. I mean, what we cannot give you give any specific feature uh, figure, sorry, uh, but uh, much cheaper than Milan. We can we can argue that. Yes, related to Milan for sure, it's much cheaper. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, and also point. I would say yeah. that the the cost of accommodation in Milan is. Um, 
much more expensive. So just also keep that in mind. Of course, you have to calculate in a year the, the tuition fee, the cost of accommodation, the cost of living, which of course depends on, on the specific case. So um, that I would say, yes, in any case, it's um, not as expensive as living in Milan. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so there was a question about uh, admission criteria and how to apply. I just wanted to make sure. Here's the link on the screen um, for you to click on. And at your own pace, you can have a look at the, the, yeah, the program overview. It gives more information about study plan, admission and enrollment data. So um, by all means, click on that. It's also in the chat, actually. Um, so there you can find it as well. Yes, basically you have to register on our um, online application portal, which is um, a specific uh, portal for international students, which means students with a non-Italian bachelor degree. You have to follow the procedure, upload all the required documents, um, pay an application fee of 75 euros, and then you can submit the application. Perfect. Okay, I think that is uh, clear. Um, I don't see any further questions at this point. So I think that has all been answered. So um, unless we have a last minute question still coming in, then we are slowly rounding off the session. I do have a last poll question, a question for the audience. Um, as I like to know how we did, how did you feel the session was? <laughs> Here it is on the screen. Uh, and I'm sorry to put it over our heads, but um, Thanks to let us know your feedback to get an idea if you felt the session was good. Um, do, by all means, let us know in the chat if you um, have any constructive feedback, of course. And we hope it was, um, yeah, dealing at least answering your questions and making you interested in this very interesting program, I think, um, bridging the gap between food, health, and environment. So um, from my side, I'd like to thank everyone uh, that have joined. We, I saw a lot of people different joining in from different countries. We had Greece, Switzerland, Spain, Albania, Siberia, Hungary, Ecuador, Nigeria, the Netherlands, all joining in. And maybe I forgot some of you, but welcome everyone. And um, last but not least, thank to all the professors and um, yeah, all of you, the, the presenters, Federica, um, Maria Rosaria and Giovanni, and of course also Gwendalina, thank you for having joined and um, we appreciate all your times and efforts. Maybe last words um, over to um, some one of you, uh, I don't know, Ma Maria Rosaria or Giovanni maybe to round off the session. That would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us and uh, thank you for demonstrating your interest in our master program. Uh, we hope um, to be on, of interest for your future uh, profession. Uh, for sure, we really believe in what we do and I hope uh, this was passed through our presentation. So thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank bye, -bye. You. bye bye. Bye, thank you.